Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Doable Discipleship Podcast. Listen up, we are in uh, a special series right now on race and the gospel, right? So we're, we're having a time where we can speak to the cultural moment that we're in uh, with everything going on in the world right now. It's important that uh, we're able to address these things. It's important that we're able to listen and learn and learn from diverse perspectives and learn stories uh, and learn more about our faith and deepen our faith. You know, this is a show called The Show That Helps You Grow, a show designed to deepen your faith in God. So that is exactly what we are set out to do. I am your co-host, Brandon Robinson, and today I'm joined by... Jason Wheeland. Jason Wheeland. <laughs> I, I, Jason, I was, you're... I, I was trying the past really few hard episodes, that time. You've been a little, little, little slow on it, but yes, yes well, joined you said by joined by. So I didn't know if Majita was going to like, you know, hop in with her eagerness and say, so I was, I was giving it a little bit of time. And uh, now that I've spoiled the fun, we do have a special guest with us. Today. Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, Majita, how are you doing today? I'm doing great guys. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Awesome. We're excited to have you as well. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so we, we're so thankful that you came on. And, and as you know, we've been in this conversation about race in the gospel. And you um, had shared in one of our staff meetings recently, just a, a little bit about your upbringing and how it was a little different than maybe uh, most people. So, so we just wanted to get some background a little bit. So what was your upbringing in Missouri like? Yes, you know, it was very different, um, especially now being in California for seven years. I'm very convinced that the Midwest has its own culture. <laughs> Missouri has its own culture. Um, didn't realize that till I moved out here, just how stark of a contrast there is. <laughs> but um, yeah, I grew up, it was pretty interesting. So I grew up um, not only being one of the few black kids um, in my neighborhood, church school, all of that, but I also grew up um, in a Zimbabwean American home. So my parents were immigrants here. So I kind of had the complexities of, you know, growing up in a Zimbabwean American home in the middle of Missouri. <laughs> so as you can imagine, just growing up with a lot of, you know, just differing identities. So not only growing up black in this country, but also um, having the African background as well. But um, like I said, I grew up in a town in the middle of the Missouri um, that was predominantly white. So I was used to being, you know, usually the only little black girl in my schools and my classes and my church, Sunday school, neighborhoods, all of that. And um, I just always remember having this sense that I was different and different being bad. I remember just having this longing to be quote unquote normal. Um, everything from my name, which is African and hard for people to pronounce. Um, so I was teased because of that and then just teased because of how dark my skin was. Um, so honestly, I really grew up resenting the fact that I was black and resenting my skin and I wanted to be white. And I actually didn't have a term for this until this last weekend. Um, I was listening to a conversation. Um, Kay Warren had an excellent conversation this weekend. Not sure if you guys got to catch it, but um, it was a Dr. Cindy Hankerson and he is an African-American doctor, psychiatrist, professor at Columbia. And they were discussing the topic of confronting race them and uh, mental health disparities. So um, I can get into more of that later, just how poignant that was with this current moment. But he described something I hadn't heard before on how racism operates on um, three different levels. And he was highlighting the work of a doctor named Dr. Kamara Jones. She's a Harvard trained physician and has done a lot of studies in this area. Um, but the three different levels of racism were systemic racism, which we hear about a lot, especially right now, individualized racism and then internalized racism. So um, just to briefly go over them, systemic racism is more of the structures of systems of racism that we've heard of, the limiting of access to goods and opportunities, whether that's employment, housing, education disparities that has been existent in the black community for years. Um, and then individual racism or more of maybe what we've all heard of about racist acts being called a racial slur or, you know, different microaggressions um, of daily common racial stereotypes that anyone black in this country has experienced. But the one that really hit me that I hadn't known before was internalized racism. And he said that this is perhaps one of the most damaging forms of racism that we don't talk about. And basically internalized racism is 
what African Americans experience as a result of living in an oppressive society. Internalized internal racism manifests itself as low self-esteem, self-doubt, a desire for whiteness, and a distancing from things that are associated with African American culture. So <laughs> when I heard that, I was like, wow, he just described my whole childhood <laughs> and wow. a lot of my upbringing. I never had a term for that, but wow. that 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 hatred of who I was because of the color of my skin, that desire for whiteness, you know, I've had several conversations with family and, you know, telling my parents, like, I don't, I'm not upset with you guys for the schools you placed us in, the neighborhoods you wanted the best for us. But, you know, just how damaging it was for my identity to grow up always feeling different and hating being black and coming home and saying I wanted to be white. So, and I think um, just the process that it took me really through my, till my 20s and 30s to come to a place where I've embraced my blackness and can celebrate that. But um, I had never heard that term before. And that was just so poignant for me of like, wow, that's what I grew up this whole time, the internalized racism and what that, how that affected my development and growing up. Yeah, that's, yeah. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that the conversation that she was referring to that Kay had with um, Dr. Sidney, oh, what's his last name again? Hankerson. Hankerson. Mm -hmm. um, we will post the link to that in the show notes yeah. for descriptions. So, so make sure to check that out um, because it, it truly was an incredible conversation. And I just think the point that you were making just about how even having these feelings and having, and having all of this going on for so long in your life, it, I'm sure it just must have been kind of, I don't know if the word is jaw dropping or eye opening or whatever to hear somebody else talk about it all these years later. And you're just like, wait a second. <laughs> like, this is a thing. Exactly. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Yeah, it really is. It really is eye opening for me. And I think that's like one of the things that I'm learning in this process is, you know, as racism has kind of become an issue that, you know, there's a collective awakening and a rise of consciousness, more yeah. people are talking about it. I'm equipping myself with more language and I'm learning, you know, different things that, you know, being able to have terms and language for things that I've experienced my whole life, but maybe never had like a word for it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was really huge for me. And I think, um, just to know, you know, even despite all of my parents' best efforts to counteract everything I was experiencing, you know, in school and everything, you know, our home, our parents always wanted to celebrate our African heritage, celebrate black culture. Um, so even with all the best of that, it still, you know, is racial and trauma that I'm still unpacking. Yeah, you, you said a few things there that I think are so important. Um, and I think the thing that I'm thinking about most is right now is really, there's a difference between race and ethnicity. Right. So, so for those of us listening, race has more to do. It's, it's what you look like. And because by extension, if you look like this and you probably speak like this, you probably vote, vote like that. Um, it's a, it kind of strips away all the nuance of who people are. And it goes to just black, which we'll talk about in a second, white, or you say, you know, or, or it's just, black, white, yellow, or Asian, or it's, it's, it's reduced down to colors, right? But we also know people aren't colors, but this is a part of the world we live in, so we use these terms. But there's important to uh, also know about ethnicity. Ethnicity is God-given. Ethnicity is, is literally the creativity and wisdom of, of God in creating the nations, in creating people. Um, and Majida, you were saying something about whiteness, um, and I've heard this, I've heard it thrown around like, well, what's wrong with being white? Mm -hmm. Nothing's wrong with being white. And I, I want you to hear me say that. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with being white. If you are <sighs> living in, a, in America, <laughs> Jason, <laughs> Jason <laughs> there's, being a, an American of like, European descent, right? If your family is of, Euro, of European descent, you most likely or what we would call in, in the world we live in, white. But the ethnicity, the European descent, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the danger when things get boiled down, when the nuance gets stripped away from things and it's just black and white, um, is I think in America, there is what is 
white culture or what is a predominant European American culture that becomes normal. And the danger there is when it becomes normal, there's a danger to make, well, this is normal. Therefore this is right. Um, and just because something might be the cultural norm doesn't make it any more valid than other cultures and it doesn't necessarily make it right. And um, Majida, when I, when I was listening to you speak it, that popped in my head of, you said, you know, you wanted to be white, um, this internalized racism. And I think a lot of that stems from uh, a predominant culture that says this is normal and, by, and because this is normal, then this is right. If your hair is like this, this is normal, this is right. If you eat like this, this is normal, this is right. Um, I'm thinking for those of us, the, of us who speak different languages, I, I, I'm learning Spanish right now and I'm, I'm studying the school, but I'm learning the sentence structure, the syntax is flipped around. Yes. It's hard for me, right? Because I have grown up as an English speaker. That's the only language my family speaks, English. Mm -hmm. So that, the way we structure our sentences, that's normal to me. But just because it's normal to me does not mean that it's right. It doesn't mean that Spanish is backwards or that Spanish is not normal or there's something inherently inferior about Spanish. It's just a culture and the, a language structure that I'm not familiar with yet. Um, and I think that's important to know. And another thing I heard you say, I didn't know that you were a daughter of immigrants. So mm -hmm. we're both black. We're both yes. black Americans. Yes. Um, and there's a, there's a difference between being African and being an African American. There's, there's a big cultural difference. So in a lot of ways, we might look the same, yes. but our cultural upbringings are different. And uh, there is even, I'd say, within the African American community, uh, with Africans from or immigrant families, it's, there's a kind of an under an, an unsaid tension. Yes. Of like we share <laughs> similar ancestral roots, but we're not the same culturally. So I'm listening to you. I'm going, oh my goodness, you're kind of caught between three worlds. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're living in a, going to school in a predominantly white school. You're raised in a culturally African home, but you're also a fir you're first generation. Um, so that's a lot to navigate. What were you taught about all of this at a young age? What were you taught about? race at a young age, yeah. growing up in this environment, navigating all of this. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you making that distinction, Brandon, because it's so true. You know, I think for the longest time, you know, if kids didn't know I was African for the longest time, especially even just in this country, even now as a black woman, I'm just treated as a black woman, you know, like you and I, like you're saying, we look the same people don't know. Oh, she's from Africa. She's from this. So in a lot of ways, I'm like, Oh, I identify as a black woman first. Cause that's what people see me as first. And then, but then I have also have the layers of, being a first generation American and what mm -hmm. that was like. Um, so I think like growing up, um, like I said, I was always very hyper aware that I was different. And, you know, I think stemming from my name, um, people couldn't pronounce it and the things like that. So I had the question as early as kindergarten, where, where are you from? What is your name? You know? And so I kind of had to explain my ethnicity, but I think like, Growing up, like I said, I feel like my parents did a great job of wanting us to not be ashamed of our blackness or our African heritage. Um, I appreciate what you said about the tensions because um, I still experience it. Um, I feel like I experienced it a lot in college when I started meeting more Africans that, you know, had just moved to this country for college and I wasn't African enough for them. And for the mm -hmm. black kids, I wasn't black enough for them. I acted white, I talked white, like all these things. So it's like, where do I fit? <laughs> so, but I think yeah. from a very early age, um, I was taught that things are going to be different for you. Um, my parents would teach us, you know, you're going to have to work 10 times harder than your classmates. You're going to have to work 10 times harder to get that job. Um, my parents were very open um, with the racism and discrimination they experienced. Um, they both are very educated, have multiple degrees, but they would often um, get turned down for different jobs at the university in our local um, town. And they would come home and they had they were just as qualified and many times, if not more qualified than the other people that would get jobs. And so they were very open with explaining to us the realities of the world that we were living in. And so I was very grateful for that, um, even though, you know, it kind of takes away a little bit of your innocence. But 
Um, I grew up in the reality knowing things are going to be harder for you. You're going to have to work harder. Um, learning how people perceive you. Um, learning that, you know, as a black woman in this country, that some people are threatened by my existence just because of how I look. Um, and I've had to unpack that as just, it's more of a cultural thing. Maybe they aren't used to, maybe they've never interacted with a black person. Um, and then, you know, you add the layers of, you know, now being in an interracial marriage and <laughs> having that dynamic of how people feel about us as a couple. Um, but I was grateful. Um, my mom was even, I've heard stories in these last couple of weeks that I've just been unpacking different experiences from my past. And my mom had reminded me of a story that, you know, I used to try to educate my teachers on different things. Like I did a report on how Christopher Columbus didn't really discover America. And I <laughs> took it to heart to explain all of these things, or I would do book reports and I would pick an author that wasn't on the list, but he was a black author or poet that my parents introduced us to. And I took it upon myself to try and educate my teachers and my classmates on the richness of African American history and culture. So I, those are stories that I had forgotten until recently, but I think it just speaks to the ways that my parents were intentional to counteract some of the things that we are experiencing outside of the home. And so I'm grateful for that, but you know, it didn't, it didn't protect us from not experiencing racism or microaggressions growing up. Um, it, it definitely helped. Um, and then I think for me later, as I grew um, as a Christian, that was really where my identity began rooted in who God said I was. And that was really a powerful shift for me. Um, because yeah, like I said, I mean, I think a lot of people grew up with identity issues. A lot of little girls grew up with identity issues, but I grew up, um, kind of just having, you know, the added hated, hating my identity just because of the way I looked. Mm -hmm. So that was a transformation in a, um, a process that God brought me through as well. Um, but yeah, very grateful for just the ways that my parents instilled a lot of those lessons early on. Yeah. So how has that conversation with your parents been going, even through this time? Are your parents, where did they live now? Um, they are still in Missouri. Yes. Yeah. Still in Missouri. Okay. So, so, okay. So I'll ask you like this then. Mm -hmm. How, how has this period of time, you know, and especially um, with the conversation being back at the forefront of conversation, how has that period been going for them still being in Missouri? And how has that been going for you with them? How, how has the conversation um, been like of recent with your parents? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, it's been interesting, Jason. I feel like um, the word I've been using lately is that I feel like so many, you know, I was used to discussing racism or things that happened to me, you know, with my sure. family or with other black friends and with it being an issue that's more front and center, it's honestly, I feel like so much of racism has just been so normative mm -hmm. to my experience growing up that this is really the first time that I'm talking about it with, um, you know, within our church, like what's been happening yeah. our staff team. I'm talking about it with white friends on a more regular basis. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's been interesting, I think, to be in this moment with them, um, just kind of recalling, you know, I've had to tell my mom, like, I don't want you to feel like you failed or you did a bad job raising me or us. Um, I know that they, you know, places where we were because they wanted us to have great opportunities. But um, it has been, I think, just having, I think, unpacking everything that's been happening. And I think the word I keep coming back to is the word trauma. Hmm. And I really feel like, um, you know, everything that's happening in this moment right now, um, we've kind of just been talking about, um, I know there's kind of two big crises happening right now, but I'll speak to it from the black community. Um, there are two massive issues that have been affecting the African American community right now. Um, one of them has been how COVID-19 has been disproportionately affecting black Americans, black and brown communities and how that has raised awareness for existing health disparities that have been existent for years. But then there's also the ongoing trauma of the tragic deaths that we've seen of, I mean, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Richard Brooks, George Floyd, just to name the most recent few. And what that does for our psyche, um, the ongoing trauma of the police brutality and um, 
even, you know, just the surge of protests, everything that's been happening, it's, it's been intense. It's been a lot. And so I think it's been a lot of people have been feeling a lot of grief and a lot of pain and intensity. And I think that's magnified in the black community, just feeling like we are being attacked by these two big um, things that are really hurting our community right now. Um, so I think processing that with them um, has been really huge, but I think also understanding that this moment is different. Um, I know that my mom, she was the first in our family to kind of have a group text with my mom, brother, and I, and, um, you know, the first week of protests in March, she was the first one, you know, out there, and it was interesting to hear her experiences as, you know, someone, she came to this country, you know, after the civil rights movement, but she's seen a lot of history, and um, I think as I've been processing it with them, you know, there's something different about this moment, and um, I really do feel like, you know, we are we are in a moment of history right now, just in the fact that there has been a collective awakening and um, a recognition of the hundreds of years of trauma and pain that Black Americans have experienced. And so um, I think just processing the power of this moment, processing what I'm seeing happening in churches and conversations and how I'm seeing people's eyes being opened to some of these issues for the first time, I think that's really powerful. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Majida, you, you mentioned uh, that your husband's white. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. So my wife and I were also an interracial couple uh, married and we were, Rob Jacobs interviewed us a few weeks ago. Um, I'm curious about that story. What, what was it like meeting your husband? Um, what was your experience like as you guys both decided to take that next step in a relationship, get married? How were your families about that? Um, is your husband from Missouri as well? Uh, what was that like? Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, it was definitely, we definitely have an interesting story. Um, so we both grew up in Missouri. Um, I grew up in, I mean, not a big city, but compared to where he lived, he lived, he grew up about two and a half hours away from me, but in very rural Missouri. Um, I mean, we're talking his town population 383. Oh, um, that's a village. <laughs> 383 <laughs> people, yes. So <laughs> there's not even a black person in the county. So let alone you're bringing home a black woman that you're going to marry. Um, so I think that um, how we ended up together, I think is really funny. But we met in college and we were both part of a, um, a college church that was really transformative for us in our growth. And so honestly, we both kind of grew up in, you know, predominantly white evangelical culture. So even though I'm black and he's white, culturally, we found that we related a lot more because we kind of grew up in, you know, in the mostly white church and especially that church that we were part of in college. So um, we'd known each other, you know, for a long time and kind of grown up in that church and later we were on staff. And so we, um, I met him my freshman year of college, but we both didn't get married till we were 26, 28. And so that was a journey in and of itself. Um, my version of the story is I had a crush on him since my freshman year of college and <laughs> it, just, it took him a while to catch up um, <laughs> and realize that this was it. Um, no, but he, um, our journey was really interesting because like I mentioned, he grew up in the country. So he honestly had not met a black person until he came to the big university where we were. And um, before we got married, he had spent a couple of years before we even started dating. He spent a couple of years working for a um, international disaster relief organization. So he spent two years living and working in South Sudan. And he's honestly said to me, and he's not, you know, he's not a racist. He's not saying he would never marry black woman, but he had, has said to me that, you know, before he was like, I liked you, you know, and I would date you, but for me, I always felt like I would date guys and it would be like, okay, they're fine dating me, but would they cross that line of like marrying me? And he honestly said, you know, had he not spent those two years in Africa, um, you know, where he was the only white person for <laughs> most of his time there and experienced what that was like. Um, yeah. And he fell in love with the culture and the people and came to a point where, um, not the color doesn't matter, but he wasn't about to let 
the color of my skin prevent him from marrying the woman that he wanted to be with. So, um, you know, he came back and we started dating and got married pretty quickly. And honestly, I mean, we had this conversation from day one when we, um, when he sat down to kind of take me to coffee to have the, you know, defining the relationship talk. Um, his <laughs> first question to me was, how do you feel about being in an interracial relationship? And I was like, oh, okay, we're going here, like right now, <laughs> like from day one, minute one. Um, and so, you know, I, I told them the story that, you know, I, I honestly kind of sat my parents down and kind of like warned them early on and starting with high school, I just said like, okay, look, you placed me in predominantly white churches, neighborhoods, schools, everything. The chances of me marrying someone white are pretty high. <laughs> Not that I yeah. can't, you know, I dated all different, I dated different ethnicities in college. My first boyfriend is black. Like not that that couldn't happen, but um, just kind of was trying to prepare them for that. And they had all said, you know, I mean, they would have loved for me to marry an African, you know, they joke about that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they've come to love Ben and they've always said like, we're whoever you want to marry, you know, we're going to love. But I mean, honestly, because of where Ben grew up, I was nervous about meeting his family. Um, our immediate families were comfortable, you know, cool with the whole interracial thing from early on. But he did tell me, you know, with my, with my extended family, you know, there's some people that are going to have an issue. And so um, I'd met his parents beforehand, but the first time I met you know, all 50 members of his extended family <laughs> was at Thanksgiving, the first holiday we were together. And you could tell the people that got the memo ahead of time that mm -hmm. I was black. <laughs> and those who walked in and, you know, really wide eyed and like taken aback and there were gasps, there were, oh my goodness. And so that was kind of my first foray into the realities that we had experienced being an interracial couple, especially in Missouri. Um, but I mean, to be honest with you, there are so many times where, and I think even everything happening in this moment, you know, has brought up a lot of race. And then, um, you know, we lived in LA where, you know, so ethnically diverse, culturally diverse, where we weren't the only interracial couple. So we kind of experienced feeling normal. And then moving to Orange County, I feel like I've experienced about the same amount of racism as I did in Missouri. But back then, and even in his family, I mean, to be honest, sometimes I forget that we're an interracial couple until I get into experiences like that. You know, yeah. um, to be honest, there are family members of his that still don't speak to me. And I've just had to learn, I can't win everyone over. I can't, you know, a lot of them have come to learn and know, appreciate who I am and get to know me as a person, not just the black girl in the family, but there are a lot of his family members that, um, and they love his family and like his, I'm not speaking about his parents or anything like that. They love me and sure, sure. Like, treat me like their daughter, but there's a lot of members of extend, his extended family that I know are still very uncomfortable around me and, you know, just choose not to speak to me. So just a lot of different challenges that we've had to face with them. Mm, that's good. So, so, it, and sticking with the, the topic of your family. Uh, um, how have you and your husband, his name's Ben. ben yes. is, that, is that right? No, mm -hmm. which is my son's name. How fun. I love that. Name. <laughs> um, <laughs> how have you and Ben uh, talked or had discussions about uh, how you would want to raise biracial kids in the future? And what do you hope to teach your kids about race and the gospel? How would you hope that those type of conversations would go. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's been something that's been difficult, you know, um, going to like these larger family gatherings. I've told Ben, like, I don't want our kids to be the ones in the corner, the little brown kids, mixed kids that nobody's playing with. I don't want them mm. to experience that. And, you know, our, our, I've had to say, are our kids going to be as loved and accepted and all the grandparents are around and all the aunts and uncles and all the kids, you know, I don't want them to experience that there. Um, but honestly, like I said, um, you know, we moved to um, California seven years ago, we spent four years in Los Angeles. And um, culturally, that was amazing. It was incredible for me even to just um, for me coming from the background I grew up in, um, to feel normal for the first time. But 
you know, honestly, I didn't realize moving to Orange County, I was just kind of naive and thinking all of California is diverse, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, you know, just even I've heard the statistic, but I had to check last night to make sure, but Orange County is 2% black, mm-hmm. 2%. Yeah. <laughs> so the thought of, you know, we're getting to the point where we'd like to have children. I never thought that I would have to, you know, we moved here for Saddleback and for me to intern and then now being on staff and wanted to be here. We love Saddleback. I wanted to be here for that, but we've had to have some really difficult conversations on, could we really raise children here? You know, like I mentioned, I feel like I've experienced more racism living in Orange County that's brought up a lot of the racism I experienced as a child. And um, that's been alarming to me because I was like, I'm on the West Coast. It's so diverse. It's different. But, you know, just walking into a Starbucks and being the only black person, feeling like people are staring at you, feeling like everywhere you look, you know, we'd go into restaurants in Missouri together and people would stare, but we experience that now. So I think it's brought a lot of questions, especially as I've been unpacking my childhood. I don't want my kids to grow up feeling different everywhere they are Mm -hmm. and different being inferior. I think Brandon, you were talking earlier about, um, you know, obviously there's nothing bad with being white, you know, um, but whiteness being a superiority thing and something that I wanted to attain so I could feel normal or so that I would um, be seen as valuable as my classmates and my peers, other people around me. So I think, to counteract that, I think like everything I've learned um, just about God's heart for me in that is something I really think I want to instill in my kids. Um, I've heard it said before, but I really feel like a lot of people have said recently, you know, reconciliation is the heart of the gospel. And I think like even for us to be together, you know, culturally it doesn't make sense. You know, a lot of people can see us and feel like that's wrong or, you know, they shouldn't even be together. But I think like I want to raise, I think for me, when I really began to understand the gospel and I really began to understand God's love for me and to see my worth and my value and my identity is rooted in who God says I am. And um, that was when I was able to counteract a lot of the other voices that I was hearing. And so I think just raising my kids, you know, I feel like the foundation of our marriage Yes, we're white and black, but the foundation of our marriage has always been our love for God and our love for each other. And so wanting to bring our kids up in that same Christ-centered environment to know that, yes, you're going to experience, I mean, I think honestly living here has just reminded me that racism happens everywhere. You know, even if we were to move back to LA, like our kids would still, they would find a way because racism is so pervasive. Um, So I think for us, it's not even been a discussion of, oh, we got to move somewhere else, but what are we going to be intentional um, to instill in our kids? And especially, you know, as I said, for me, my identity as a child of God is my primary identity. And that was when the tide began to turn for me as far as really learning to embrace my culture and the ethnicity and all the different complexities of who I am. And so I think for my kids to know that their worth and value is tied in who God says I am is really powerful. So I think that gives me hope. I think, um, honestly, everything happening in this moment, um, I feel like, you know, I've been reflecting a lot. We just celebrated, um, 10 years of marriage and nice. Like, Congratulations. You know? yeah. Woo. yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And so it was interesting. Our anniversary is June 5th and that was the first week of the protests and everything was happening. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I couldn't even make a traditional anniversary post, like celebrating 10 years of marriage because <laughs> there's so much more happening. So much going on. There's so much more I wanted to say. I think even just like, um, you know, I looked it up a couple months ago, but Loving Day was a big deal, June 12th, the week after our anniversary, basically celebrating the day when universe or interracial marriages were legalized in the United mm-hmm. States. So I, I think that was 1967. Yes. Which yeah. is insane to think about. That's really not a long time. Is. Yeah. It really is. And I've just been thinking about, okay, that was 53 years ago. And it's hard for me to comprehend a world where, you know, I wouldn't have been able to marry the man that I love. Yeah. And I think that that's given me hope for this current moment because I honestly believe that everything that 
we are fighting for now and how the church, I feel like, has such a critical role in fighting for justice and truly eradicating racism, I feel like everything that we are fighting for now, it's going to be different for our kids. It's going to be different for our grandkids, our kids, kids, because honestly, I want them to grow up in a world where they can't even believe that someone like George Floyd would die in the streets the way that he did. And I honestly feel like so many of the things that my ancestors fought for, um, you know, we are continuing that fight now, but I really do. What gives me hope is to see how the church is stepping up in this moment and how Christians are saying, this is our fight. You know, this is our fight. It begins with, you know, Pastor Rick has been saying stories and conversations are the way forward. And I really believe that. I really believe that people listening and repenting is really the start of what's going to change. Um, and I've been encouraged by that. I've been encouraged to see a true heart change within people, within our staff team, within, you know, people really saying like, and admitting just the humility that it takes to say, like, I didn't see it before, or I couldn't see it, or I didn't understand it before. Um, so I don't know, all those things just give me hope that it's going to be different for our kids. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's so true. I think there's something extremely powerful about story. Um, it's from the beginning of time, it's the one thing that grips our hearts in a way um, that other things just can't. Information just can't. Um, but there's something about the power of story that it has a way of getting into our hearts and it, it unlocks things and perspectives in a way that other things can't. And it makes me, um, makes me wonder. So for, for you, Majid, like what, what do you hope to see from the church in this time? Like we, we know you're on staff at Saddleback Church. Um, you're on case team. Like what, what's your hope for the church? Not just Saddleback, but Saddleback also definitely included, but, um, as a whole, what do you, what do you hope to see from us going forward? Yeah, I believe, um, like I said, I think, I think what I hope to see is that just an understanding of, I had this thought last night, and I think Brandon, you said it before with this issue that this is a discipleship issue. Um, I yes. feel honestly that, um, I was just thinking about this analogy of, um, you know, the journey of becoming a Christian, of becoming a Christ follower, um, it's not something that happens overnight, right? So um, for me to really understand, like, what does it mean to be a Christian? Um, that journey is, um, it's something that's a lifelong journey of knowing God and being loved by him and following him. And so I think my biggest encouragement is just that this journey of, being more aware of racism, of the journey, if we want to say, of becoming anti-racist, that's not something that can happen overnight either. And I really do believe it is a discipleship issue. Um, just as, you know, when I first became a Christian, I was reading tons of books. I sought out mentors, people that were a little further along than me. I had peers that were at the same place in the journey with me to process. And I really believe, you know, just the fact that we're never done with that journey as Christians. Um, I feel like this journey of truly eradicating racism is a lifelong journey. So I think that what I hope from the church is to see just a true commitment to that and to that process. And, you know, I think it's, it's going to be messy at times. It's going to be uncomfortable. I think, growth comes out of discomfort and for people to really, I know you guys have talked about um, even with pastor AC a few weeks ago about sitting in the pain and entering in the pain with other people. I think yeah. um, my biggest hope is that the church wouldn't ignore this issue. Um, I'm grateful obviously for the ways that I feel like Saddleback hasn't been doing that, but I mean, I know a lot of friends that are experiencing, like I said, the black community is hurting right now in a lot of different ways but to also experience more wounds and pain from your church right now is something that's really, really painful. And to have past their pastors not say anything or speak up or acknowledge some of the pain. So I think that 
I really honestly believe that, you know, a lot of people are saying, I'm listening, I'm learning, you know, you see all over social media, but to be part of a church that truly is listening, truly wanting to learn, I think that posture of humility is so powerful because um, I feel like we can't go anywhere from there until there's that, until there's a repentance and a willingness to look inside our own hearts because we all have prejudice and bias in our hearts. I think something I've heard over the last few weeks from people is, you know, I, I knew that racism was real, but until I heard your story and some of your experiences, I didn't have a, a face for it, or I thought it was something that happened years ago, or, you know what I mean? And so I think that mm -hmm. us sharing our stories and people becoming more aware, um, is also a part of the growth. But I think my, my biggest hope is that, um, I mean, I think it's at the heart of the gospel. It's at the heart of who Jesus was to fight for those who don't have a voice, um, to stand up for the oppressed. And that's why I really do believe. And, um, you know, going back to Dr. Sidney Hankerson's conversation with Kay this weekend, you know, he really said, I believe this is a church's fight. And, um, I really do believe that the church is positioned in a place to really be able to fight for this for the long haul. But I think okay. it, I think it just has to be an awareness that it's, it's going to be messy. You know, we're not going to get it right. Um, there's going to have to be forgiveness on both sides. Um, I, I just, I really do. I really do believe that. I feel like just the season that we've been in with, um, with COVID-19, I feel like, has set us up for where we are now. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I think that was all extremely well said. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about your marriage with you, you and Ben, um, you said the foundation was your, your love for God and love for each other. And I can't help but think, man, that's, that, that's exactly uh, at the foundation for this conversation that we're having right now, love for God and love for each other. And when we can say a word like anti-racism, um, it's because racism is anti-gospel. Um, yeah. it, it, it can't co coincide with the gospel. Uh, one, one has to take precedence over the other. And when you think about, I have a graphic design background, um, so I still, I think very visually, um, mm -hmm. but when you think about the cross and how reconciliation is central to the gospel, um, there's two beams on the cross. There's a vertical beam and there's a horizontal beam. And we talk a lot about we're vertically reconciled to God between God and us. You know, we, we absolutely do have personal relationships with God and the spirit does. In fact, the Holy Spirit does dwell within us, right? As individuals, but it's also a collective. There's also that, that horizontal beam um, that we can be reconciled to each other because I have the spirit of God living in me, because you do, uh, Jason, because you do, because we are in a really, in a real spiritual sense, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and I think that's so important to understand, even when Jesus is uh, speaking and he's asked, well, what's, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, the love of the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and there's something so crucial there about the, the horizontal reconciliation to, to really love your neighbor, to really love yourself well, to love God well. Um, there's just something there that is, you can't take away from the gospel. Even I think it's a second Corinthians five that it talks about we've been giving the, the ministry of reconciliation. We can kind of boil all of the work that God is doing down to that one word, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. He's reconciling people to himself. He's reconciling the world to himself. And we join God in that reconciliation work. Because we've been reconciled to God, we can be reconciled to each other. And I think when we do that, I think the church is, it, that's something that uh, uh, because of the gospel, it's something I think is unique to the church. There's a lot of uh, organizations, institutions, groups of people that can, um, fight for justice, fight for equality. And that is a hundred percent valid. And I, I affirm that, but I think the church can take it a step further and offer reconciliation where other places or people or institutions can't because we are reconciled. And because we're reconciled, we join God in reconciling. Uh, we join God in that work. 
Uh, and I think that's the unique offering of the church in this time is not only can we have talk about justice, not only can we talk about equity, because these are extremely deep biblical principles, but we can also talk about reconciliation and we can also offer reconciliation and model what that looks like to a watching world. And I think that there, that is an incredibly beautiful opportunity for the church in this time. Um, like Dr. Hankerson said, like th this is the church's fight. And I think I, I affirm that and I hundred percent believe that this is the church's fight. Uh, and we have a lot to offer the world. Definitely. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. Good stuff. So as we think about this in coming to a close, Jason, any, any final thoughts, Majida, any final thoughts? I'll start with you, Majida. <laughs> Sure. Um, I just wanted to share something that I've been processing just in terms Please. of um, this season and um, kind of even before everything that's been happening racially, um, just kind of beginning of our quarantine COVID-19 season, um, I was brought back to um, just a passage in the Bible in Exodus where the Israelites were um, just entering the wilderness, just entering their journey you know, towards a promised land. And um, there were so many um, parallels to that situation. And I just feel like, um, honestly, everything these last several months of COVID-19, I've been processing um, a season that happened to me about 10 years ago, but where very similar to this one, everything that was once normal has kind of gotten stripped away. And I didn't realize how transformative that journey was with me and even just lessons I learned from God in that period. But um, just there's something about this season and um, I'm not at all talking about um, the collective grief and trauma of COVID-19 and the raising effect and the number of people we've lost, not discussing that, just more talking about um, this period of slowing down of life as we know it and just the spiritual significance of that. Um, but, you know, just looking at when the Israelites first entered the wilderness, you know, they were complaining. They were like wondering, how long are we going to be here? How long is this going to last? We want to go back. And I've heard that sense of like this longing of going back to normal from so many people, which is normal in this season. But um, I've just been reminded, I think, on my journey the last 10 years, living through a chronic illness and kind of having my normal stripped away from me, um, just that the wilderness doesn't have to be a place that we fear, but the wilderness is a place where we can be healed where God can actually free us. And, um, you know, the Israelites were brought through the wilderness in stages, much as I feel like we've been brought through this journey in stages, you know, like we had, I don't know if you guys remember the tiger King phase of quarantine and, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> we're all baking and we're all becoming, you know, influencers, yeah, baking bread and stuff, yeah. bread, yeah. bread starters, yeah. bread. <laughs> tiger King. You know, like we had that stage and then now we're, oh, now we're in a civil rights movement of our own. It feels like three like, years ago. <laughs> it really does, you know. And so I've just been thinking of just that journey and just the significance, even the word quarantine. I um, didn't know this till pretty recently, but um, there's has Latin roots to the number 40. And obviously 40 yes, has yeah. a lot of spiritual significance. So just thinking about this time as a time where God has been bringing us into this season of unknown um, but ultimately to speak to us. And so um, I just feel like, you know, the wilderness is a place that strips us away from our comfort and all the distractions that we once had and all these things. And so I just really feel like God, um, I know you guys talk a lot about um, with this podcast being doable discipleship. I just feel like in this season, one of the things that I have really learned is to not resist um, some of the delays and the stops and the starts and even just where we are, but, um, to just find God speaking to me in the stillness and, um, finding ways, um, you know, he brought his people, he journeyed them through the desert for years, but it was in the desert where they learned to depend on God in ways like they never had to before. So, um, I've just been thinking about just the significance of this moment, um, being in the midst of a global pandemic and life not looking normal, but I think it gives us an opportunity to find new rhythms and new ways to connect with God, but also um, just time to, I don't know if you, you guys have experienced this, but on social media the last several weeks, it just feels like everyone is shouting, you know, everyone is shouting, everyone is, you know, 
they're speaking their opinion and their voice and there's just been a lot of condemnation and all these things and I just feel like um there's so many different lanes to what's been happening I think something I appreciated was someone saying like the revolution has many lanes you know some people are protesting some people are donating quietly some are learning some are having conversations some are educating their children about racism I just feel um I feel like this journey that we're in is really a sacred time but um a time to really just kind of look at okay god like what do you have to speak to me in this moment and just finding ways to um create space to hear from to hear from him above all the noise mm, that's great that's, that's great stuff i don't feel like i want to add anything because <laughs> <Me> neither <laughs> <laughs> because that's that was all great <laughs> that was a good way to end it absolutely <laughs> oh we really want to thank you for your time, Majita. We just really want to th- thank you for your your openness and your candor and sharing your story and um, and just re- being a part of this conversation with us. You know, it's 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 been really um, it's been a great thing that we've been able to have this conversation on this platform over the last uh, few weeks, and we're um, excited to have a few more of these uh, in the works too. Uh, on Thursdays or Fridays. So um, for those of you who are listening, uh, don't forget, yeah, we will be um, still having our time series going for the next, uh, I think, two weeks or something like that. No, longer than that. Well, well, for time series. you're right. Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, three more weeks of time series that we'll release on Tuesdays, and then we will continue having some of these conversations um, that will – release later in the week. So thank you for being a part of that, Majita. Really cool. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much for having me. I'm really honored to get to be here with you guys. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, you were a great guest. I'm thinking about a doable. And I think what we should do for those of us listening, the doable, we always like to, Majita, we always like to end on a doable. Just kind of make it practical. Let's read through Ephesians 2. Read through Ephesians 2. Pray through it in your quiet time. Um, this week leading up till next Thursday for our next conversation. That's all I got. This has been a great conversation. You guys, we will be back and we will see you soon. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes. And go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week. Music